says. So, uh, thanks very much, Anne. And uh, I'll hand this over to you. Oops. Good evening. Uh, nice to see so many familiar faces. And I uh, hope you've been enjoying it so far. Um, I think you might have gathered that this is actually a talk about individuals coming from left of field against the prevailing culture of the time. Um, and I'm going to continue this, but uh, we're going to cross the water a little bit. Um, I could have called this talk what did the Germans do for us? Uh, actually, quite a lot. Um, so that, in a way, is sort of what this is all about. But um, I'm anchoring it roughly from about 1880, just otherwise it could have got totally out of control. Can we have the first slide? Um, really, we're looking at Germany, and um, if we're talking about counterculture, we really need to know a little bit about, without going into huge history lessons and what have you, we need to know a little bit about the culture to understand what counter countering was against that culture. Um, I think what really, really worries me about social history and cultural history um, is that even things that I can remember, like the late 60s, early 70s, there's a huge amount of revisionism going on. Uh, I don't think the internet and um, BBC4 stuff helps a great deal because you're really getting sound bites and this black and white version of what actually went on. So if we're seeing that with stuff that's so recent, um, really, what is it like when we're going back to the 1880s to the 1940s, and especially a country like Germany, um, where there's been so many unfortunate uh, yeah, <laughs> which may have coloured our view of German culture. Um, and actually, before the First World War, England and Germany were like this culture. We were very, very close indeed. Uh, and Germans actually, the highest immigrant population in Manchester up until the First World War were Germans. Yeah? And I don't know if anyone knows, but it was a German sculptor who designed a live bird on top of the live building in Liverpool. So there you go. Anyway, so yeah, the Germans. Um, like I said, I'm anchoring this roughly in 1880 for a reason. Uh, Germany was just a, a scattering of princely states until 1871, so it didn't even become a country until then. Um, that was really significant because their industrial revolution didn't start until nearly a century after ours. But when it did start, it was incredibly rapid. Now, obviously, that's going to have repercussions on the people because a rural society suddenly became an urbanised industrial society. Um, and as we may know from our history lessons, there was rapid militarisation, uh, a lot of sabre rattling, urbanisation, all the rest of it. So this really impacted people's psyches, really. Um, the Germans have always had a very strong relationship with nature. And this is key to what we're going to be looking at. Um, I'll just read out a couple of things here. But even in the Middle Ages, the Adamites in Germany held nude gatherings in moonlight caverns to achieve rebirth into a state of paradisical, paradisical innocence. Uh, Goethe, um, the poet of nature, this is the uh, 18th, the early 19th century, said, God can be worshipped in no more beautiful way than by the spontaneous welling up from one's breast of mutual converse with nature. And it was actually a German who invented the concept of ecology, uh, Ernst Hecke, in 1866. Um, and he turned something that was actually more of a spiritual thing into a science scientific discourse, uh, which was quite new, yeah? um, and he actually said that really ecology was the true religion, um, stating that it had a much better foundation than an abstract worshipping of an invisible god. So that, that's quite a controversial thing to be saying in 1866. Yeah? Okay, um, I think we can move on actually, let me just check. 
Okay, so um, we've jumped in a little bit, but um, yeah, so I've, I've said about the rapid industrialization. Uh, really, by the end of the 19th century, uh, the newly unified country was a very prosperous country, um, but again, uh, this did have an effect. It sort of, in a way, spiritually, it sort of stagnated. Um, one historian actually puts it, the German middle class had become superficial, coarse, complacent, gluttonous, materialistic, industrialised, technocratic and pathetic. Yeah? Um, so people were gradually starting to realise that you know, for all this material well-being, um, there were some really malign side effects of all this, uh, you know, even for the prosperous. So it was a sort of spiritual and, and decline, really. Uh, and uh, again, um, as Michael Green, another historian, noted, the iron cage weighed heaviest in the fight against it was fiercest in Germany. So this idea of being caged in provoked a reaction um, which was equally extreme. And this is really what we're going to look at. Yeah. Um, right, so this slide really, um, obviously, 1914, devastating war, defeated nation. So how is that going to impact people? Um, so really, from this point on, really up until the 1950s, and then we built in Germany, it was just non-stop chaos, basically. <coughs> um, it was physical, it was spiritual psychological, you name it. So, you know, forget about what we think of Germans as such. Just imagine living through that um, and what that could do to you. So, there we are, 1918, defeated, economic misery, thousands of soldiers returning back, disabled, uh, no income, rapid inflation, um, and this is really what people were living with. Next slide, please. Um, I'll, I'll run through this extremely quickly because this is history. But on top of all that, we had political chaos. Um, basically, um, the, the, the Kaiser stepped down, so they had no, for the first time, Germany had no monarchy. Um, so every single political group was, was fighting really for dominance. So you had the left wing and right wing, there's a, a quick sort of uh, review of it. Um, these Freikorps are actually quite interesting, just as a side thing. Um, they were actually paramilitaries, um, yeah, unemployed soldiers who were really itching for a fight. But the state got them in to suppress the left wing revolts, and they were extremely vicious. Um, Again, just as a side thing, it was from, from the Freikorps Corps uh, that Ernst Röhm recruited the brown shirts in the 30s because they were so vicious. Um, okay, uh, yeah, can we move on, I think. Um, again, more street fighting. Uh, yeah, Freikorps Corps again. Yeah, can we move on? Um, so basically, all this carried on until the Weimar Republic was eventually uh, founded in, and I really should know this actually, shameful, August 1919. So, about a year after the end of the war, after a year of total chaos, there was a Weimar Republic. Um, and this is probably, you probably heard of this actually. Um, I think what I really like about I'm just going to point this out. This photo here, which is very obviously staged, it's from a series of postcards that were issued by the state, really propaganda, to show that the troops were actually keeping the left wing revolt under control. So it's nearly all photos of these left troops, but uh, it's this lad here that I'd like you to look at because we're going to be looking at teenagers in a minute. Um, look at the way he's dressed, um, and this is, remember, this is the late 1920s. Look at his hair, look at the, look at the attitude, you know. Uh, now, he is apparently a left-wing dissident. Um, he looks more like a 1980s clubber, actually, and that is, that's not a coincidence. Yeah. 
yeah, can you move on? My pictures of troops, okay. Uh, but it gives you a bit of an idea of how violent this actually was. It wasn't just you know, a few people throwing rocks in the street. This was serious. Um, okay, carry on. Yeah. Okay, so the flip side of the coin of all this, and I mean, obviously, this happened in England in the Roaring Twenties. Um, people just were sick of it. They just wanted to have fun, really. Um, now, what's very interesting is that in 1919, the Weimar Republic actually abolished censorship. So there was no censorship, basically. Now, this had a really interesting uh, result um, in that it, it freed up the creative arts, obviously. Um, now, this led to the most amazing firing of German culture. And I, I personally think it's never been surpassed before or since. Um, you know, film, cinema, painting, music, you know, really innovative stuff. You know. um, this lack of censorship actually only lasted until 1920, but my God, they made the most of it. You know. Now, this is probably the Weimar that everyone knows and loves. Um, it's actually a lot worse than this. I couldn't actually put some photos on me, to be honest with you, for reasons of taste. Um, but it just gives you a bit of an idea, really. Um, I love Anita Berber, an uh, amazing woman, really. Yeah. Um, she's in a couple of films, actually, so if anyone's interested in Anita Berber. Um, yeah. So, yeah, if we move on, uh, more creatives. Uh, I mean, again, we're talking about counterculture. There's, there's lots of different ways of being a counterculturalist. So, artist movements, again, caught up in the political flow of the times. I mean, in a way, this links in quite nicely with Joe's talk, because these were the German equivalents in the 1920s who were really trying to kick against the norms and do something new that actually meant something political it was significant. Um, that actually was a class war. Um, so yeah, um, by the way, all these photographs of like August Sander, who, who was trying to record every single type of different German, I think he took 20,000 photographs up until the Second World War, and they are fabulous. You know? So he lived in Cologne, so he, he was part of this group. So that's just a few of the artists, yeah, can you move on? Um, more, let's see, we have proletarian selections, they really work the part. Um, there's Matt the Hegeman here, yes. Um, I think uh, what I just briefly wanted to say before we move on, German film, which is one of my, my, my favourite things, um, just to point out, really, um, that around this time, when it started getting a little bit sticky in the early 30s when it became Chancellor, there was a mass exodus out of Germany and Austria, especially Jewish Germans and Austrians. They went to America. Um, so I'm thinking people like uh, Otto Pellinger, Hutzland, and many, many others. You know? A lot of these people were involved in the, the Berlin, Munich, Vienna theatre scene. So you have lighting specialists, um, musicians, cameramen, directors. They went to Hollywood and they made films. Now look at the look at the production of the credits on films made in America in the 30s and 40s. They're incredible. Nearly all of them are Germanic names. Yeah. Um, Watch film noir because, as far as I'm concerned, that is German film. Um, it only lasted until the end of the Second World War, and then American film changed completely. So you've got this amazing period between about the mid 30s up until the late 40s. Those films were basically the whole psyche and angst of, of German, Weimar Germany was taken across the Atlantic and slapped onto American urban milieus. So you've got the tormented hero, the psychologically flawed heroes. Um, you've got the dark streets, the rain, the women, you know, who always die in the end. Yeah. So classic, it's a classic middle European sensibility. 
in an urban, an American urban setting. And it's some of the best films that have ever come out of America. So, shall we move on? Yeah. Right, uh, oh sorry, a little bit more, just to give you an idea that, right, yes. Um, remember the teenager I was talking about? Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about this, because this is very relevant. Um, I'll have, I might have to read some of the, the stats here. Um, obviously, First World War um, destroyed families, enormous amount of feral children in, in the German big cities, uh, destitute and homeless. Yeah. Um, according to this, after, the, after 1929, half a million homeless adolescents living uh, rough, wandering around the country, in, just in Berlin, 14 and children between the age of 14 and 18 living rough. Um, so what did they do? They joined gangs, basically. So what we have here are some of these kids. Um, a lot of the ones in Berlin, as a collective name, were called the Ring Gangs, but they all had different names, yeah? Um, including Blood of the Trappers, Red Apaches, Black Love, Black Flag, and the Forest Pirates. Yeah? Um, they usually supported themselves through prostitution and crime. Johann Schaffer there was a rent boy. Um, notice the way he's dressed, actually, because this is classic. Uh, basically, they dressed in black and grey bowler hats, um, old women's hats with the brims turned up, adorned with ostrich plumes and medals with luring handkerchiefs or scarves worn around the neck. Striped vests were worn, revealing tattoos and multiple rings worn in the ears, leather shorts with massive belts painted in colours, numbers and human profiles, and with tags such as wild and free or bandits. You know? Um, this does actually start to make you think. Um, I know we're talking about hippies, yeah, but we're seeing the sort of branch here. You've got the sort of the urban gangs, with and we're really seeing a clear link to, to urban gangs over here, like the Scuttlers, the Pinky Blinders, um, the Costa Gangs in London. Um, very, very similar. Yeah. Um, so yeah, next, next one. Um, the Edelweiss pirates uh, developed slightly later. Not all of them were feral kids. A lot of them did have uh, work, work in factories and what have you. But what's very significant about them, as it says here, um, they did form in the cities. And again, larger numbers of people, yeah, up to 10,000 inhabitants often during the dancing. Um, it had elements of drunkenness and ecstasy, <laughs> creating an atmosphere of spiritual revivalism. Yeah? So obviously the churches were pretty suspicious of the company. Uh, next. Um, oh, shit, we've done a bit too fast. Uh, anyway, basically what happened to Bob Lampady, he started shagging his young followers. <laughs> so that was the end. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's always a downfall. Right, now, really have to race through this, um, Diefenbach, another dude, I mean, another really charismatic figure, um, not like, I don't think, but, um, you can see it. <laughs> He was actually one of the earlier ones. He, he, in fact, he was one of the first, because he was doing this in the 1880s, which is incredibly early. Um, you can see by the hopes. Um, people did laugh at people. I mean, like I said, even though the life of Sean was quite almost mainstream, um, to see people like this walking around Munich, which is where he was based, um, dressed like that, yeah. Um, there was satirical postcards made. Yeah, this is somebody called Wurzenzek who apparently dressed like that in leather shorts. And, um, Munich is a lovely city. Um, it has lots of different people. Um, for example, I am showing you two originals here, Wurzenzek and Diefenbach. Um, these two, everyone stares at them when they walk past. Can we move on? 
So I think Diefenbach is actually one of the, the, the very important people because I think he's, he really is the first one and we can actually trace a clear line, timeline, between the people who followed him who led on to more people who led on to, and it ended up in California. So he is quite important. He was actually a very talented painter. He was a, an establishment painter. This was him before he saw the lights, yeah? Um, uh, as I said, he was based in Munich, which was actually a huge centre for, for creatives and quite innovative ideas at that time. Uh, we don't hear about that very often. So, um, yeah, so he, he was in touch with the free thinkers like this, the nature cures, the hydrotherapies, all the same things that crop up again and again. And um, like herbal remedies, that was a big one. Yeah. He found out <laughs> German. <laughs> Um, he, founded, he founded this in 1885, rejection of monogamy, now that caused a lot of problems actually for him. Uh, vegetarian diet and more problems, he rejected religion completely. So it, it was pure nature. Um, okay, to do, to do, to do. Yes, he was, he was mocked hideously in Munich. I mean, people really did laugh at him and he didn't like that. So. Um, he left for Austria and established a, <laughs> yeah, um, established a commune in 1896 called the Heavens, Heavens Hall, Himmelhof, uh, Heavens Yard. Yeah. Uh, can we move? Yeah, next slide. Uh, so this is, this is him, basically. Um, so, I mean, if that's not a flipping teepee, I don't know what it is, really. So this is his extended family here, uh, living in tents as they travelled across the country. Um, next one, there's a few nice photos. I think, I think the reason I think he's a bit of a flipping ego tripper is the amount of high quality photographs that were taken. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, these, these cost money to do, so he wanted a record of himself. So I love this one, I love this one, yeah. So this is him and his commune. Um, I love the, the little, little long things there. Fantastic. Um, okay. Do, 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 do. Carry on. Carry on. This is him again. Posing there. Posing there. <laughs> I love this photograph because uh, this is actually a policeman. He's just in the lap. He's a pissing himself, basically. You don't want to see a Russian policeman laughing like that. So, yeah. Um, I think what's important about him is, is some of the people who actually joined his group for a while. Um, we're going to meet them later on. Gustav Glaser, who's hugely important. Um, Hugo Hippener. Um, they, they both left him, basically, because he, he was very authoritarian. And he, really, he was the leader, so he wasn't having it. So, um, so really, again, he came to grief. Yeah. Um, We've got a couple of pictures of his artwork, so next. Um, oh, here we are, yeah. He was, oh yes, he was mocked as the coil of Abbey Apostle. I think that's um, cauliflower, cauliflower Apostle. Um, people really didn't like his style, yeah. And, and he was, oh, that's right, he was actually arrested for uh, letting his kids run around naked and also for being naked himself. But he got somebody, he got one of his followers to do his jail sounds for him. So that's says it end, really. Uh, he ended up in Capri um, with a group of women followers. He's Harry India. Kids rejected him. He, he actually produced some of his best artwork in Capri, so it wasn't all in vain. So, there he is, handsome to the last, yeah, so that's Diefenbach. Okay, uh, next, uh, that's just some of these paintings, just to give it. Very heavily influenced by general romanticism. If, any, if anyone knows Casper David Friedrich's work, um, romantic painting, very like this, yeah, but obviously very influenced by nature, uh, you know, the apocalyptic sort of nature as well. Fantastic sort of portrait, actually. Okay, next one. Uh, that is probably his most famous work. Um, he did this amazing freeze. Uh, these are those. That's again. That's him and his children. Um, it's very good actually. So okay. So that's it. Um, 
very briefly the good side again you know there were a lot of people were they see actually was a wandering preacher he preached the word about um, but what's interesting he was a Prussian army officer you know and you just think that's an amazing fucking change you know from an immensely sort of autocratic environment to go from that to that uh, and that's what I mean you're trying to put yourself in, in the mindset of this you know, you know how, how extreme that actually was um, he joined the Diefenbach group um, but again he didn't like it too, too authoritarian so he, he left and formed his own groups um, again and what he, what he wondered I mean the, the key thing about these people they all, they all go wandering some of them live in caves they all have an epiphany uh, so they all have that in common really so he settles as a preacher um, the new human he, he did have an awful lot of people followers you know, because of these views was, yeah. so next um, we might have to scoot through this he was really uh, Diefen Buck's right hand man the, the faithful Fidus as in Fidus yeah, Diefen Buck called him that because it was actually Fidus who served the jail sentence for Diefen Buck yeah. um, Fidus was another very talented artist yeah uh, next uh, there he is with Diefenbach. Yeah. Um, next. Now, the thing about his paintings, um, they were kind of forgotten about and then they were rediscovered in the 1960s by the Californian West Coast hippies, basically. And they absolutely loved this stuff. Yeah. Now, I've looked very hard and it, it, it says, and it's meant to be over here, but I can't see it, that he was the first one to do the, the peace symbol, you know, the one that, you know, and I can't see it, but I'll have to take their word for it, so, but <clears throat> it's all there, basically, I mean, these could have been done in the 60s, so, they, you know, they were quite influential in the sort of later psychedelic sort of, yeah, so next one, again. Okay. They're quite ahead of their time in a lot of this stuff, really. Um, again, he, he left uh, Diefenberg and set up an artist called in Berlin. So, yeah. Um, do, 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 do. Very interesting German mythology. Um, do, 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 do. Yeah, it's just really right. Can we next one? Yeah, so again, look at this. Mm -hmm. um, next one. Right, I just thought this was fantastic because that, that picture there, Salute to the Sun, 1913, did actually become the, the image of the life before the neighborhood. Like I said, that pose crops up again and again and again. And you can see it in the net from the film. Oh, it is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next. Um, I love these. He did a whole load of designs for pagan temples uh, and he seriously wanted these to be built. Uh, they never were, which is a bit of a shame actually, but this is, this is pretty fierce stuff for, for the first decade of the 20th century. <laughs> I'm not sure how this would have gone down in England. So, <laughs> so next, uh, and I mean some of these are just Really. They all had names. The Temple of Still Waters, 1899. Uh, I can't really see it. But anyway, I mean, these were huge structures. Um, and I mean, nothing, nothing else. They have been done. But they were pagan. I mean, these were pagan temples, not Christian ones. Um, okay, right, now we come to very important, very important person. Gusto Glazer. Um, I, I can't overemphasize how important Gusto actually is. Uh, again, there he is there before me, and there he is. Yeah. So he did join Ethan Bell's group and left it. Um, I'm trying to say that so Gusto Transylvania. He was an artist as well, actually. Um, quite a recognised one. He burnt all his work and dedicated himself to inner exploration and nature studies, poetry and dance. He was a great one for dance. And 
um, gave away all of his inherited money and just lived as an itinerant. Um, so he joined that group when he was 18, but he later left it and again wandered through Europe with his family in a little caravan. Um, and they, yeah, giving away poems or blades of grass as gifts. <laughs> um, the Van der Fogel youth groups absolutely adored Gustav Glaser. Yeah, um, you know, read his poetry. And, now, um, Gernot Helpman, I don't know if anyone knows German literature, but a very famous German writer, he actually regarded Gustav Grace Hazer as the personification of the new man, as extolled by Nietzsche and Walt Whitman. But he was also mocked as well, obviously. Um, a lot of towns actually banned him from even entering, entering the town. Um, very sadly, uh, yeah, next, next slide. Um, oh, I can't believe that was taken in 1900. Unbelievable. Yeah, um, yeah there he is again. Um, yes, he, he was arrested. Um, he was a pacifist, so at the break of the First World War, he, he, he refused to sign up. Um, he was going to get shot for it, and then they, they locked him up in the asylum instead, yeah, during for the First World War. Um, he got out, he, he was locked up in some of them later on, <laughs> again, yeah. Um, because he, he went around preaching one day about violence and pacifism, which didn't make him very, very popular, really. Um, okay, uh, next. Yeah, this is just him, his little pony and trap, you know. This, I think this is an amazing project. This is him in 1950. So that's the middle of the First World War, and he was preaching pacifism and getting arrested. And all. Yeah, he was yeah, sentenced to death by firing squad. Um, we'll come to Ascona in a minute, just keep it in mind. Yeah, but I think this is an amazing photo. I mean, he basically got a bald, ravaged tunic, and him dressed like that, wandering around, looking, looking upset. Um, um, next. Uh, that's Gusto in old age, really. Um, still preaching here in search of roots. That's basically what he was all about. Uh, next, Gusto. Okay. Um, next. Right, this is actually why he is so important. Yeah. Um, that's his brother, Carl. Now, in 1900, like many of the other preachers and what have you, he set up a colony, uh, but this one was immensely important. Yeah? It was at Monte Verita in Switzerland. Um, it started off with this house that he actually, his brother, built, yeah? but you can like, just tell me what it's all about. Yeah? He wanted this to be an ideal community, so he wanted equality for women, uh, naturism, free love, Total creativity, experimenting in, in arts, dance, and music, poetry, um, discussion, yeah? um, houses of light, natural food diet, vegetarianism. Yeah? Um, Herman, I'll come in a minute who actually came to this place. It's mind boggling. Uh, I'm not sure why I didn't know about this before, actually, but anyway. Kafka went there, Herman Hesse went there. Herman Hesse was hugely important. Um, he loved Gusto Grazer. Yeah? Gusto Grazer, the discussions they had crop up in a lot of Herman Hesse's books. Uh, he based a lot of the characters in his books on Gusto Grazer, and that's verified, that's not a supposition. Yeah? So Demio, uh, Zarathustra's return of Arab Gusto Grazer. Yeah? Uh, next. Um, this is kind of what it developed into, so, yeah. so it lasted until the 1920 actually. It's still there, it's a sort of a cure place you can go and have cures. Um, next, so these are just some people at Um <laughs> Yes, um, it's fantastic anyway. Um, 
Yes, and also, if anyone's ever read Siddhartha by Herman Hesse, which was written in 1922, that also is based on his discussions with, with Gustav Grazer. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the thing about Herman Hesse, he was required reading right through the late 60s and 70s. You had to read Herman Hesse if you were a, any way a hippie or a counterculture, so even just right on, you had to do it. So we were all reading, and we didn't read. It was about knowledge and happy. So, so there we are, there they all are. There's some of the people who, who went there. D.H. Lawrence, well, no, he was into liberation and free love. And, you know. uh, Carl Jung, so, um, Carl Jung, Max Weber, Carl Jung, Max Weber, Carl Jung, Carl Jung, Max Weber, Herman Hesse, Kafka, and Isadora Duncan. Think of the, the dance, Isadora Duncan. Um, I like that Otto Gross was there because he, he was actually pretty hardcore anarchist, actually. Um, Protege of Freud. Um, his father actually had him locked up after he went to Ascona because he, he heard about what was going on there. Um, and Kafka was inspired. Now, I can't verify this, yeah, but I've read it more than once that it inspired Kafka to write the trial based on Otto Gross and what he experienced. So, who knows? Uh, next, okay, there's the, the light air huts. And, you know, go back to that. It was run as a, a cooperative system, promoting the emancipation of uh, women, new ways of cultivating the unity of mind, body, and spirit. Now, that's a phrase that we still use. You know? um, a Christian communist community. Um, but I think what is incredibly important is just that the, it was the uh, concentration of creative people that passed through there and lived there, interacted with each other, influenced each other, and a lot of them went to America, a lot of them did. Um, and that's the key, that's where it crossed the Atlantic. Okay, um, next. Yes, I, I've got here, 96, what, um, have, I don't know who's heard of Timothy Leary here, but how important he was, um, have a professor who investigated uh, psychotropic drugs, LSD in particular. Um, he actually wrote a book called The Psychedelic Experience, The Bible of the Hippie Movement. Yeah? Um, they actually paid a tribute to Carl Jung in the uh, introduction. Um, and quoted him extensively, yeah, consciousness, um, archetypes, significance of dreams and internal perception. Now, these were all ideas that Carl Jung, again, spread here. You know. um, yeah, Carl Jung actually did, when he was asked, he did, he did do a lot of fasting, diet, excessive hiking. This was another one that you could achieve. Sort of, Sublimation of spirit through exhausting yourself by made of that. And I've actually seen an amazing photo of Herman Hesse climbing the mountain naked. And I have heard that Franz Kafka also did this, but I haven't actually seen photographs of that. Um, right, okay. Yeah, next. Um, right, um, again, think of uh, Muk Lampady and his achieving ecstasy through spontaneous dance. Um, this was taken a step further at Ascona. Yeah, Mary Ridman, incredibly important. Yeah. Um, and as we know, Isadora Duncan was there and picked up a lot of ideas. Um, it was actually called expressionistic dance. Um, now, it, it, apparently, it did have its counterpart in expressionist painting and, and music and what have you. But anyway, she did pioneer this a little bit. Yeah, she was a very close friend of the, the Grazer brothers, and Gustav Grazer actually created expressionistic dances that she interpreted. Um, and maybe even more well known, um, Rudolf Laban. Um, I think people may have heard of Laban. Uh, next, uh, that's not really doing anything. Mm -hmm. Next, gosh, it might be playing up a bit. Yeah, more of it. <laughs> next, 
Yeah, so he, he's the man and his dance troupe, yeah. Um, his expressionistic dance was interpreted into a more structured form by Lovan, yeah, and he performed it publicly as the German or expression dance. Yeah. Now, Lovan was hugely influential in, in modern contemporary dance, so again, that's a couple from the uh, Next. And these are just really nice having tinted pictures of the Lavan dance group at Ascona. Um, and then again. I like this uh, quote. He led his chain of naked maenads celebrating sunrise by the lake in the meadows. So you think this was the outbreak of World War I? Yeah. Very, very old. Mm. Right, so. Um, like I said, I can't stress the importance of Ascona enough. So maybe, uh, I don't know if we get time actually. Um, we'll, we'll just write, you know, some of these key individuals who left and went to America and were hugely influential, yeah. So next. <coughs> um, the founder of natur Naturopathy. So he, he went there, he was running the sanatorium at Ascona, yeah. Uh, went to LA. Um, this is what he wrote. Yeah, you can still buy this now. If you if you Google this, these books are all still in print, so, and people are still following what he said. Uh, like I said, Steve Jobs, President Reagan's daughters. Yeah. What interests me again is that Franz Kafka based the short story The Hungry Artist on him. Yeah. Uh, that's him looking very thin. So yeah. So next. Uh, and Max and Sikina, again, very interesting, because those feral kids in Berlin that we were talking about, he was actually one of them. He was only about five feet tall, through so malnutrition, he was very small, but he pumped himself up. So again, he, he'd already heard about the healing and nutrition movement, the Lewis reform, yeah. Um, went to America, um, pioneered women like Ewan White, working with the Ronstein. He was one of the first people in Muscle Beach that kind of made Muscle Beach what how it is now, you know, the pumping iron and all the rest of it, you yeah. um, And again, he lived long enough to, to see that he was a, a regular fixture at the, the 60s festivals and everyone knew him, basically. Um, we'll come to that uh, Nature Boys in a minute. Uh, move on. Uh, Benedict Lust. Again, first health food store in America as early as 1896, and there it is, in Lexington Avenue. Um, American School of Naturopathy in New York City, first one in the world. You know, so, again, very important. Um, you can still get Knipe stuff now, but again, if you do it, it's there. Next, um, Adolf Just. Um, Play birth therapy. Again, you can go Google, you can have just sachets of therapeutic play posted to your home now, if you want. Um, this, is, this basically sums up this whole thing about the stress of the age we need to get away from. I mean, I think it's ironic that in the 60s we were still talking about it, and we're still talking about it now. So, um, Evolution of science, theology, all these disturbing words happen in the sense of the yeah. A sense of universal unrest that really sums it up. Um, be at peace with yourself. Um, okay. Um, yeah, actually, these people are really good because um, used to list. Quite confusing. Um, they were actually busted by the American authorities uh, a lot, and they were very suspicious of what they were up to. This is a hill station. A lot of hippies went there, heard about all these these ideas, and took them back to Europe and America, thinking that they found the real India. They haven't. <laughs> they found the real Germany. <laughs> so, the clinic's still there. <coughs> It's called the National Institute of Naturopathy. Um, yeah, so it's still there, you can visit it. Uh, right, Bill. Bill. Um, I love this. 1917, middle of World War One. he maybe is with his guitar. Yeah. Um, so, Wilhelm Pester. 
uh, yeah, he was a conscientious objector, so he fled Germany, um, settled in California. Um, quite an interesting link I see here between him and Diefenbach, who we looked at earlier on. Um, he actually ordered books from Diefenbach because he was really interested in his ideas. Yeah? And you may have actually got to know him around 1888. Um, when Diefenbach and Fidus visited Leipzig for a year, so they, they could have actually met, which is quite a nice thought, really. Um, he was known as the Hermit of Palm Springs. Um, he was just a hippie, basically. So he was very into life reform. So he just lived in his little hut there. He had a telescope, and, and people used to look at the stars. Um, he just wrote and explored the canyons, earned a living by making walking sticks from palm blossom stalks, selling postcards with life reform health tips and changing people 10 cents to look through his telescope. Um, <laughs> he made his own sandals, collected Native American pottery, played slide guitar and lived with raw fruit and vegetables, usually naked. Um, Apparently the Native American Indians <coughs> adored Bill Paston. I thought it was really lovely and had an honorary member of their, their tribe or group. Um, okay, next, so this lot here are the next huge, these, these are sort of the linchpin between the Germans and the hippies in the 60s, because most of these guys lived into the sort of 80s, 90s, some of them, yeah. So this is based in 1948, so uh, just after the Second World War. Now, these guys all knew people like Bill Pester, Max Sicking, uh, um, uh, and the way that they got to know about all this was the health food cafes that were spreading out in California, run by Germans. You know? um, the most famous one was the Eutrophion, a vegetarian raw food cafeteria in LA, run by John and Vera Richter, which was opened in 1917. Um, they used to have discussions and lectures about vegetarianism and healthy living. Um, the Eutrophia was the torch where they lit the lamp. Um, and Richter was their inspiration, organic farming and natural lifestyle. Yeah? So communities actually formed around this cafe and shared information. Um, and a lot of the books they read were by these German authors. Uh, um, so they basically lived like this. Jack Kerouac actually mentions the nature boys on the road. They just saw these weird looking books, sort of uh, in beads and sandals, wandering about it. Right, next. Um, I didn't, it was a shame I actually wanted to play. You can, you can YouTube this song. Uh, Actually, um, you will know it when you hear it. So, Ian Abes, um, one of the nature boys, he was quite lucky to be honest with you. He was a musician, he was actually a pianist and dance band leader in Kansas City. So, he went to LA, met Bill Pester um, in Gypsy Boots, um, and really influenced them. So, he just turned to this way of life, eating raw fruit and veg. He changed his name to Ian Abes. Um, didn't use any capitals, that was important. Um, like many of the German um, again, like many of the other people we've met, he lived in a cave for a while in the wilderness and had this epiphany about how he should lead his life. And it was while he was in the cave that he wrote that song. Yeah? And as you can see, it, it was in the Joseph Rose film, which was actually banned, the film, because it was a pacifist film. Um, next. Uh, and there, there's Eden, really strange photo of him with Frank Sinatra, who absolutely detested hippies, I mean, quite violently detested them. So what he must have thought of Eden and Bez, I did not know. Um, there's not King Kong. I think the best version is actually the George Benson version, so Google, YouTube, George Benson, Nature Boy, fantastic. So, and there he is with Brian Wilson. It's amazing. It's amazing. Next, uh, there he is, just living my life. Um, 
A bloke called Steve Saylor noted, when walking with his father in Hollywood Hills above Laurel Canyon in the mid-60s until the 80s, about one in four people they passed in the trails would reply good day with guten tag, or a Nordic equivalent. Um, hiking then became quite fashionable away in the 90s, and the Germanics all seemed to vanish, which was quite strange. Yeah? Uh, author Gordon Kennedy's actually written a book about the German influence and counterculture, um, and he concludes that there was nothing strange about the fact that there was such a huge German influence. Yeah? Um, it's actually 20th century mass culture that is the weird thing. Yeah? And what he says is, hippiedom is really just a perennial subculture as old as the first humans that ever walked upright. That's why hippies will never go away, because they've always been here anyway. So I hope you've had a little taste of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm So please do put one in your pocket. 